This is Terms of Reference. I'm your host, Stephen Laddick. Jacob Korenblum is the CEO, president, and co-founder of Sukhtel. Sukhtel designs and delivers custom mobile solutions that connect job seekers with employers and help development implementers get information to and from the people they serve. Prior to Sukhtel, Jacob worked managing economic development and emergency relief projects for USAID and the Canadian International Development Agency. Fluent in Arabic and French, Jacob has worked in the emergency aid sectors in the Middle East, East Africa, South Asia, and the Caribbean. He is a frequent panelist on technology, development, and labor markets, with speaking engagements ranging from the GSMA Mobile World Congress to the World Bank Human Development Forum. He has co-authored a chapter in the sector publication Mobile Technologies for Conflict Management and has written articles on mobile technology for the MIT Innovations Journal, CNBC Online, and the Overseas Development Institute. His work as a Sukhtel co-founder has been profiled by the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Fast Company, and the UK's Guardian newspaper. Jacob holds a Master's of Education from Harvard University, where he was a Harvard Reynolds Foundation Fellow in Social Enterprise. I spoke with Jacob in Canada. Hi there, Jacob. Thanks so much for being on the Terms of Reference podcast today. Hi, Stephen. It's my pleasure. Great to speak with you. And we're, we're recording this in early April. Where are you sitting right now? So today I'm sitting in Canada, which is where I'm from, but I could usually be found sitting many different places in the world, the Middle East, uh, the U.S., Africa. We're on the move. Our our whole team is on the move very regularly. So that's where you find me today. And I'm going to assume that it's on the move because you are the head of a mobile technology organization called Sukhtel. Tell us about your position at Sukhtel, a little bit of history there. Sure. So uh, I'm the CEO and I'm one of the co-founders and Sukhtel designs and delivers custom mobile software solutions for the aid sector. So we serve implementers of aid and development projects and then we also serve funders directly in different circumstances. We're an interesting mix of people. Uh, Half of us more or less come from the aid sector. So I myself used to work for Oxfam and another uh, implementer called Education Development Center. Other of our team, other staff have worked for Save the Children, for Mercy Corps, for uh, USAID itself, and so forth. So that's 50% of our team. And then the other half are real techies, so software developers and former mobile network staff. So these are people who have worked at mobile networks and have come to help us develop software uh, that helps people get information. Tell us about you specifically. Uh, you said you know you were at Oxfam, you were at other NGOs. How did you stumble into the aid business? Sure. Well, I mean, if we want to go really back in time, when I was doing my undergrad degree, um, I, I was prepping to join the Foreign Service, and that was the the vision that I had. So that you're changed. you're actually one of the rare people who said, "I want to do this." Yeah, somewhat, I would say. So I I really had my sights set on the diplomatic corps. I had an interesting experience in undergrad where I went abroad and I worked in Senegal for close to a year for a project that was funded by the Canadian, what was called at that time, the Canadian International Development Agency. And that kind of shifted my thinking. And I thought, hey, you know, I really would rather get into the aid and development side of things than the foreign policy side of things. So that was an initial motivation. And then you know, from there, I went and I learned foreign languages. So I studied Arabic for a number of years. Um, and then I went to DC and I started working for uh, one of the eight implementers, so Education Development Center. And they took me to the Middle East. They were implementing a project there. And so I volunteered to go over and found myself in Palestine for the first time about 10 years ago. And was there implementing a standard uh, donor-funded project, but was really noticing how young people were using mobile phones. And this is 10 years ago, so this is before you know mobile devices became this really ubiquitous part of your daily life. But, this but even isn't, then, but it's, but it's not far back. Like this isn't Palm Pilot stuff. This is still no, t- this no, is but, still? <laughs> uh, well, yes and no. I mean, when you're looking, when you're thinking about 2005, definitely smartphones were not prevalent uh, in the Middle East, you know, and so we were looking at basic mobile devices and what people could do with them. And on the side in the evenings, I started really thinking about this. And then that grew into, into Souptel, which now has been around for 10 years, is in 20 plus countries and, and works in, in partnership with 15 to 28 implementers and funders in in any given year. If you look at the different types of services or or, or products that you deliver, what's your baby? What's your favorite one? 
Well, I mean, one of the things that we started out doing and is still extremely popular or in high demand today is is a matching platform over mobile device. And we started that as, as a job matching platform. So what that meant was you're a young person typically and you're looking for work and you don't know how to find work in your immediate surroundings. Your web access in the traditional sense is kind of limited. You don't have job centers. Uh, you're in an emerging market. The resources are fairly limited as well. And so you really don't have a good way to get job info. And then employers on the converse side um, are looking to recruit, but they don't have a very streamlined way of getting uh, information out to people. And so we built this supply demand matching platform, if you will, and we call it job match. And that really took off in emerging markets and, and still is highly used because these are not places where monster.com or even LinkedIn are, you know, or the order of the day. I mean, people have basic smartphone access starting now, uh, basic data access, but really it's about getting that information in text and, and in many cases also in, in mobile audio format. Um, so that's one of the things we're really proud of having uh, developed. And what's the business model behind it? Is it donor funded or do you charge a fee for it? So it depends. I mean, in some countries, we partner directly with the mobile networks. And so it's offered as a, as a standard service, you know, much like you would get special uh, SMS packages or data packages or so forth, and, and you pay per use. And that would be whether you're looking for a job or whether you're posting a job in more high risk or lower income settings, it is donor funded. So it's totally free to the user. And then the donor looks at, and we look with the donor at options for commercializing or transitioning the service to a funded or sponsored model. So that in the longer term, people can still use it. Was your initial role, you said, you know, you helped co-found it 10 years ago. I assume that your fingers were in the pie pretty significantly at that stage. Have you stepped away and you're more visionary? You're, 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 uh, uh, an evangelist for your organization, or are you still in the mix? Both. I mean, I think it's important, especially as we're growing really rapidly now, to make sure that, you know, none of us lose sight of our actual end users on the ground. So I, I really make it my business to get out and meet with people who are using the service as much as possible and to stay very, very involved with the product development team, with the project management team, uh, with our clients. And so that's why I'm on the road a lot of the time. It's just getting out there and having, uh, you know, eyes, eyes or feet on the ground, I guess you could say, where we were. Tell me about, you know, you so the job matching strategy or the system is sort of your flagship that you started and it's still really, really popular. I see, you know, that you do mobile money applications, you do polling and data collections. Across that umbrella of, of products that you deliver, can you think of a, a story that you could tell us about an unintended outcome that you thought maybe, you know, somebody found a job that sure. was completely unexpected or maybe somebody, you know, won the lottery through your mobile money application, something that was just like, wow, we didn't expect that to happen, but boom, here's this community that was affected. Yeah, I mean, I think a really interesting unintended consequence, which <laughs> had both positives and negatives attached to it, was uh, when we launched one of our first services in Somalia in East Africa. And I mean, this is a really unique market. You know, it, it faces a lot of challenges, primarily because as a as an entity or as a region, it is not it's not part of the international community. So it's not recognized as a cohesive whole. There are three sub-regions to it. What this boils down to is you don't have a standard diplomatic representation. You don't have standard commercial air flights. You don't have a standard banking system. So it's really kind of on its own in many ways. At the same time, you've got, you know, 9, 10 million people living in the region who are looking for work, who are contributing to the economy, and so on and so forth. So we, a few years ago, launched um, mobile audio information services that ran the gamut from job information to financial literacy to preparing young people with soft skills uh, through a series of recorded audio programs. And you, you could call in on your phone, it was on demand, and it was free, and you could listen to a recorded segment where characters uh, actually went through a storyline and you learn different things. And then you could do a quiz at the end and you could test your knowledge. So that was the concept. Um, we rolled it out in partnership with one of the major mobile networks in the region. And, you know, we thought this would be something new, interesting. Many Somalis can't read. So we thought audio was, you know, an important way to get content out. And we had it in our heads that maybe on a preliminary basis, we'd see, I don't know, a couple thousand people at best would use the service. Now, the mobile network went out into the local media and promoted this and publicized it, did a fantastic 
launch of the service. And what ended up happening was within the first week, they did such a good job that we had over 250,000 people calling into the hotline. Holy now, <laughs> yeah. So you, you basically um, shut down the mobile network. It's well, brilliant. so here's the thing. I mean, on the one hand, that was awesome. Demand completely surpassed what we thought was going to happen. But on the other side, it was like, okay, you know, we only budgeted a certain amount of sponsored calls, and now we're going to blow right through that. And also, yes, I mean, traffic on the network. So it was a really interesting lesson for us in terms of planning for scale and trying to ensure that we have a very good visibility into what the appetite for service is going to be. So we do a lot of market research and a lot of testing, both in terms of the infrastructure, but also, again, the demand for these services before we roll them out. Because again, obviously, we had a great outcome there. And the kind of epilogue to that story was, you know, we got a bunch more additional support and we were able to really roll that thing out to to many more mobile users. But I think the lesson we learned was, you know, plan things carefully because you just don't know, uh, you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Taking that particular project, what's the measure of success? Is that an ongoing program? Does it have a finite timeline to it? Is it still running today? Like, how are you continuing to say, hey, this has value? This Mm -hmm. is, and and at what point does it become self-sustaining? Sure. So, I mean, my background is in monitoring and evaluation. I mean, that's what my professional training and experience is prior to to helping found Sugtel. Um, so, you know, we look at the very specific KPIs uh, or quantitative metrics, number of people using the service, number of people who are responding to quizzes, how their quiz performance, for example, if there is a knowledge testing component, how that changes over time. You know, so all of those good quantitative indicators and running a mobile tech service in a country gives you access to that quantitative data. It's great. You know, how many people called in? And typically, again, that data in many cases is anonymized. So we're not pouring over people's personal information, which I think is a really important point to make. But we can get, we can see, you know, which parts of the services were more popular. uh, What did people like? What did they not like? And so on and so forth. But you know, equally important to me is the qualitative side of things. And I don't mean to be cliche here, but, you know, we did a a service in South Sudan. It was an early, one of the earlier instances where we set up mobile hotlines for people to call in or text in their feedback on radio programs. And basically, nobody had ever invited listeners across South Sudan to actually give their opinion about something like this. It was just beaming out the radio programs. And when we set the hotline up, you know, the kind of feedback we were getting qualitatively was amazing. I mean, people, there, there were programs, for example, on orphans and vulnerable children. And we had people texting in and calling in and saying, you know, I am an orphan and this is the first time I've ever, hear, I've ever heard somebody, you know, that I can identify with, for example. We, there were other uh, programs on the dangers of skin lightning cream, uh, you know, the adverse health effects. And we had people coming uh, and texting and calling in and saying, you know, I never thought I could talk to anybody about this. Uh, thank you very much for raising these, uh, these these issues. So I think the qualitative side is, is as important because it really gives you a flavor for, you know, how people truly feel about some of the technology that you're rolling out. Tell me about the systems that you're using to perform that both the quantitative and qualitative measurement of your of these programs is have you created a proprietary system where you're where you're capturing all this or is this something that you're doing on the fly or how does that work so i mean it is software that we've developed so it's part of the platforms which we build for our clients there's a very robust analytics and reporting section of an online console which lets you look and see all of the data that i've been describing there's map overlays so you can understand where people are interacting with the service where they're calling from or where they're texting from or where they're accessing the web the mobile web services from and there are great ways of displaying for your own reporting purposes and your own stakeholders or feedback purposes, what the data looks like. So it's very much not on the fly. We, we were very intentional about wanting to get good data back to our clients and then also the community. I mean, that's, this is the main thing too. If you're giving your feedback in to a feedback hotline, it's important that you hear your own responses and then the, the views of other people and you get a sense of how many people have contributed feedback. So we really push for that as well. Take me down the the rabbit hole just a little further across the you know the the broader development and aid universe. Monitoring evaluation is as I'm, obviously your 
well familiar with has been a conversation going on for 20 years now, maybe longer. And it's really, you know, at a fever pitch right now. Is every solution, it, and does it need to be custom built for every program, every donor funded program or every donor funded initiative? Or are there blanket solutions that, that we can use out there? So that's maybe a little bit of a different question, <laughs> which is which is independent from monitoring and evaluation. And so the, this question about custom design and whether, you know, you can and the reusability of technology. So, look, there's been a really strong push towards open source, towards not reinventing the wheel, toward ensuring that, you know, what you invest money in from a donor standpoint in one instance can be reused and repurposed in another instance. And we support that and we work very much as part of that approach. And again, you know, you see donors and implementers coming together to identify a set of ICT for development principles, uh, you know, of which those are several. So, so that's kind of, I guess, one perspective on the, on the reality on the ground. The, the other perspective on the reality is that, so we have relationships with, as I say, in a year, 15 to 20 different implementers. And over the course of our 10-year lifespan, you know, close to 100 different aid implementers across the globe. No two countries are the same, and no two situations are the same, and no two projects are the same. And I think there's been a lot of pushback in the evaluation world about, you know, the consultant who comes from Madagascar uh, and has just finished his trip there or her trip there and then goes to Malawi and says, okay, yeah, I'm just going to apply the same log frame approach that, you know, worked there. It's going to work here, too. And I think, you know, we as non-residents of Africa or Asia, again, I'm Canadian, I'm from Canada, you know, there's been a real pushback against this idea of cookie cutter or template solutions. And from our clients, we get that a lot. They come to us and they say, look, we like product X or we like product Y, we like what it does. But for our project, we need, uh, you know, we need to be able to to feed data into a specific Ministry of Youth, MIS, you know, a database system, management information system. Or, look, we want to make sure that this is available in seven different local languages that it's currently not available in. So, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at where the sector is going and the industry is going uh, tech-wise, local content creation and local ownership is extremely important. And so I think the challenge for us is, as a sector on the whole, is how do we make sure that we have economies of scale and we are making the most out of our investment in technology while not just imposing cookie cutter solutions, uh, mm. if that makes sense. Sure. Absolutely. We've heard about your success in Somalia. We've heard about success in South Sudan. And I'm sure as we all do, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about our successes because that's what we want to promote. Can you tell us about a product that maybe fell on its face or an initiative that you put out there that just ended up becoming, you know, fizzling out in a way and, and what you learned from that? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, one of the I think challenges that we faced and one of the questions we had right at the start of our work was the products that we designed, is there a is there an application for them in in extreme conflict zones at the time of emergencies, if that makes sense? And so, you know, we based in Palestine and Jordan, where most of our software development team and our project management team uh, reside, thought, okay, look, you know, we can roll this technology out here. We've we've rolled it out in Gaza uh, to serve communities there many times. And so if we have similar crisis events around the globe, surely we can lend a hand and we can, uh, you know, we can contribute in a similar way and the technology is easily applicable there. So we, in our early days, tried a number of different deployments outside the core areas where we worked and more in the realm of natural disasters, which we had less experience working with. We, fortunately or unfortunately, unfortunately more I would say, no people made disasters quite well. So we work in conflict zones, we're based in the Middle East and so forth. But to take that knowledge and expertise and apply it to a typhoon or to apply it to an earthquake, um, there's, again, as I just was talking about in terms of, you know, not templating solutions, there's a whole different set of circumstances. So there were a few instances where in our early days, we really tried to, uh, you know, apply our technology, take it from a conflict zone where there are specific needs, and then move it to uh, an area of natural disaster, where typically, I think the main difference is a natural disaster will typically occur over a very short period of time, right? So you've got an earthquake, it lasts several seconds, but it then creates this whole ripple of, 
you know, of damage, which then will need a long-term solution to address. A typhoon is going to happen over a 12, 24-hour period. We are accustomed to delivering services in conflict zones where conflict is ongoing for weeks, months, years. And so the thinking and approach is a bit different. So I think that was a, a, you know, a key lesson for us to learn was you can't just take a solution from one area and apply it to another Mm -hmm. um, without substantial modification. Are you guys working in Syria at all right now? We're working to help Syrian refugees, yes. So So Syrian refugees. the border areas, in the camps and those kinds of things? Syrian refugees who are in that region, exactly. Wow. To us, I mean, that's a prime example of you've got a conflict that is now surpassed the five-year mark. So when we build services for our clients in those instances, we're now looking more at not the proximate problem of how do you get people connected with food and shelter and water, which we do in Gaza and in other places like that, uh, you know, Libya, for example. But we take the longer view here with our uh, clients in, in those regions. And now we're talking about how do you provide legal assistance for refugees who are now not living in their own country and need help? How do you provide access for social services? So all of these much longer term uh, events. What's the next five years look like for Sukhtel? Is there a, a new product that you have sort of bubbling up that you could, you know, sort of give us a sneak preview about? Or is it more of the same? Or is there some trend that you're watching that you think you're going to catch the wave of? Sure. So, I mean, we're working on a number of new things, which, you know, I'll be happy to share when they're <laughs> ready to hit the paper. Uh, <laughs> sure, but, of course. But in the, in the short term, I think trend-wise, what I would say and what we've been looking at, and I think what affects the communities which we serve is... You know, right now we're in an interesting transition phase between people having either no mobile device or a really basic mobile device to low-cost smartphones, right? So low-cost smartphone penetration is ramping up very rapidly in a lot of the markets that we serve. But it's a middle era right now. It's a middle period. It's a transition between you had no phone or you had a basic phone to now you are smartphone equipped. And what does that mean in an emerging market? So you've got these really interesting unique cases like Myanmar, where basically the country's going from no mobiles to only smartphones. That's a bit of an outlier case because, again, Myanmar's just recently been opening up to global markets, if you want to call it that. So, you know, that's kind of one, I would say, outlier. But in most countries, it's now a range of access to phones. So you might have a smartphone handset, and it's a basic one, but you can't afford data. So we're seeing all of these initiatives surrounding free access to free basic services. So we've partnered with Facebook on the Internet.org initiative to help get, again, low-cost Uh, rather free of cost, basic services out to mobile users in a whole range of countries. So we've built content provision channels, which uh, have enabled financial education to get out to internet.org users. And that's now been rolled out in close to 10 countries, I believe, or getting getting close to 10 countries. We're partnering with Mozilla on their rollout of, again, a very low-cost smartphone device to look at how uh, you can facilitate app building for basic mobile device users and people who have never actually used a phone before but and don't have a software background but want to be building basic smartphone applications. So we're helping Mozilla build the backbone of that platform. So to me, I think a really interesting place right now and for the next two to three years is going to be, you know, this transition between very low cost devices or rather very low functionality devices to smartphones in emerging markets and what's that, what that is going to look like. And so we're very much at the forefront of initiatives in, in those areas, rolling out our own services, but then partnering with Facebook, with Mozilla, and you know those types of key players to make sure that we are giving communities the most affordable data services that they can possibly get and, and life-changing information. Why nonprofit? Why was the initiative started as a nonprofit and not a for-profit sort of service or, you know, sort of uh, revenue driven organization. So we actually, as of, as of the present time, we actually have both, which is kind of interesting. So we are a social enterprise. Sure. We've got a for-profit entity and a nonprofit entity. We, in the U.S. now, the option to incorporate as a B Corp or a kind of a mixed entity uh, exists. It did not when we started. So again, for us, our key focus is ensuring that we're serving communities and delivering information that's life-changing. We're not selling pure commercial services. We are not doing e-commerce for the sake of e-commerce. We're not doing ringtones. You know, we, in everything that we do, focus on delivering social impact and meeting a social bottom line. 
why the question to be for profit at all? Why actually have that aspect of our business in any way? You know, it's interesting. When we wanted to finance our growth, there are basically two options. One is to go to a foundation or institutional funder as a nonprofit and try to get some growth funding. And then the other in the for-profit world, of course, is, is venture capital, right? And so for us, it was really important to keep our options open, being based in a region that's a challenging region and also a region with tremendous opportunity, but looking at, you know, what are the best viable paths to growth and where can we really interact with funders who understand what we do because it's very unique not a lot of people do what we do and what are the opportunities for growth in that regard and so having both the for-profit and non-profit has enabled us to really connect with a wider array of uh, partners who who get what we do and who want to support it uh, you know in various ways hmm. that's fantastic have, have you guys started to go down the venture capital road or is that confidential no, no, no. We, I mean, we have we have uh, two uh, large funds who have supported us now for close to three years, actually. So these are funds that are based out of the Middle East, but they're registered in the U.S. and the U.K. Mm-hmm. And they are what are often referred to as a fund of funds. So, um, if, for example, their membership includes the European Investment Bank, the uh, Soros Economic Development Fund, the School Foundation, Google.org. So it's really kind of interesting. You've got these nonprofits like School Foundation investing in a venture capital fund, who's then giving venture capital to a social enterprise. So it's sure, and then it's, you know, so it's yeah. It's, then the, you know, where does the return go? Because ultimately, you know, th- there's got to be an exit. That's the whole point of venture capital. Very mm-hmm. interesting. What I would say is, you know, it's it's impact investing, so it's a very different kind of animal than, uh, you know, than pure traditional venture capital, and and I think that's really important because for ventures like ours to grow, um, and you look at, you know, small startups, whether it's in Nairobi or Abidjan or you know or Ramallah, where our, most of our team are based, in order to jump up from that, you know, situation of being two people working in a cafe to you have an office and you've got a client base, you need that injection of growth funding, and right now. The private sector is very attuned to making that happen, and they've got the models in place to do it. Institutional funders like USAID or Omidyar Network or others are definitely making big strides in that direction. I think they're doing a lot of great work there as well. And so, you know, those are the key aspects to getting more ventures in this space up and up and running. What about you for the next five years? Is you know, are, do you see yourself continuing to be the CEO of Sukdel, or is there a, a new role for you, or or some other place that you want to touch that you're excited about? Listen, I mean, this is what I love to do. You know, it's something that I have done for the past ten years, and I wake up every day, and I could not imagine myself doing anything different. You know, I think the work that we're doing is always going to be changing. Uh, the the nature of the landscape we work in is going to be changing. But uh, to me, I mean, it continues to be such an exciting thing to do. We're taking technology, the latest in, in mobile tech and everything great that's going on there. Uh, and we're applying it to address some of the key social challenges in our world. You know, I was at Mobile World Congress in, in Barcelona, and this is the annual industry event for the mobile sector. Well, last year, there were 75,000 people there. And a year before, there were 50,000 people there. This year, there were 93,000 people there. That's like bringing Mm. a city to the city, you know? And so it just, to me, is indicative of the growing influence of mobile tech. And I think we're just going to see so much more that's exciting that, uh, you know, that's that's coming ahead. and, And I'm really personally excited to be a part of that. Jacob, I always end our interviews with this one question I ask every guest here on the show, and that's, you know, you had more of a traditional path into the development and aid world in that you started in the foreign service and then sort of found your way to to, to founding Sukhtel. Many of our listeners are people who are either coming out of a master's degree and looking for their first position or they're transitioning from, you know, another sector into development and aid. What's your one or two pieces of critical advice about how to create this sort of sustainability and this satisfaction that you found? Well, I mean, you know, like any job, I think you have to be really passionate about what you do. Otherwise, you know, I would not recommend doing it. I think managing expectations, you know, the aid sector is, it's not investment banking. You're not going to be making, you know, pots and pots of money doing this kind of work. But I I would hope that that's not the reason why you're doing it. You're doing it because it's very rewarding and it's a very direct way to have an impact on the lives of other people. You know, I think I would advise anyone who's interested in getting into this work to focus 
focus on what skills you can bring to the table, specific hard skills. So is that financial management? Is that teaching and learning? You know, is that agricultural or engineering skills? I think that there are real key opportunities in the areas where hard skill, uh, you know, hard skill sets are there. And so those are great entry points. And for anyone in general who wants to be interested, I think just get informed about, you know, what organizations do, what opportunities there are, and then also the challenges. I mean, it's not an easy lifestyle. You know, a heavy travel lifestyle sounds glamorous, but it's it can be difficult. And so I think it's important to be realistic about that too. Jacob, thank you so much for your time today. This has been a fantastic talk. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. It's, it's been my pleasure and, uh, and great to, uh, to have the chance to be on the show. You've been listening to the Terms of Reference podcast from aidpreneur.com. Subscribe to us on iTunes. 